My name is Ed Flynn. I'm the City Council President. Viewers can watch this City Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. I'd also like to ask all of us to be respectful and do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you'll be asked to leave. If you fail to comply, you might be escorted out. Please also note that according to City Council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum, please? Councilor Arroyo. Here. Councilor Baker. Here. Councilor Braden. Here. Councilor Coletta. Here. Councilor Durkin. Here. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Flaherty. Here. Councilor. Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Lara. Councilor Lu Zhen. Here. Councilor Mejia. Here. Councilor Murphy. Here. And Councilor Worrell. A quorum. Thank you. I've been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Today's clergy, I would like to ask and invite Councilor Mejia to the podium and introduce our clergy for today. Councilor Mejia. Thank you, Mr. President, and good afternoon, everyone. Really excited uh, to be here with you all today and introducing um, today's clergy who's gonna open us up in prayer. I'm incredibly grateful uh, to have the opportunity to invite um, Bishop Dickerson uh, to join us here today. Um, for those who know, I started off my career working with young people at the height of the violence here in the city of Boston. And one of the things that we often talk about is the Miracle Mile, not the Miracle Mile, the Boston Miracle, um, and all of the work that it took to really address the violence that was happening in our streets. And it was an uh, initiative that was led with faith-based um, organizations, nonprofit organizations, and community. Because when we're thinking about violence, we have to recognize that everyone plays a role um, in helping to address the violence. And so um, uh, Bishop Dickerson was a, a big player in that space um, in creating um, opportunities for the faith community to be engaged in those violence prevention efforts, so it was through that work that I got to see him in action. So, I don't know, 20, 30 something years later, here we are. Still having the same conversation and the only thing that has changed are the players, um, but we're still here grounded to do this work. So, um, Bishop Dickerson was born in Virginia and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. He is a graduate of the Boston Latin School. After graduating from Boston Latin, he went on to complete Bible school. He has an undergraduate degree in business management, a master's in education from Cambridge College, and a master's of art degrees in urban ministry from Gordon Cornell Theological Seminary. Dickerson holds an honorary doctorate studied at Harvard University and is a certified HIV and AIDS educator. Dickerson taught and counseled troubled youth and adults for many years. He has spoken frequently at schools, jails, and prisons. Bishop Dick Dickerson is a former Boston Public School teacher and a former adjunct college instructor. He is a former chaplain for the Boston Police Department and a former member of the National Chaplains Association. Dickerson is a civic minded and socially active spiritual leader within the greater Boston community. Under the administration of the late Boston Mayor Thomas M. Menino, Dickerson served as the federal advisory board of the Enhanced Enterprise Zone in Boston. He has served on a transition team for Mayor Thomas Menino and former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick. Under the Patrick administration, he served on an anti-violence council. Moreover, he is a um, former re-entry consultant for the Department of Corrections. He was raised in a God-fearing God family. Bishop Dickerson and his wife of 39 years, Lulu, founded Greater Love Tabernacle in 1989, the year I graduated from high school, y'all. Today, he is the chairman and president of the Charitable Trust of the Inhabitants of Boston, the president of Restoration Ministries, Inc., an organization designed to train 21st century pastors and five-fold ministry leaders, the president of Greater Love Community Cares, Inc., 
a nonprofit agency that helps economically marginalized individuals and families and serves on the board of directors for the Kearney Hospital in Dorchester. It is with great pleasure that I call upon Bishop Dickerson to pray over the council meeting today. Thank you, uh, Councilor Mejia, um, but I have to correct. They asked me for the abbreviated version. I thought I emailed it and I apologize for that long um, bio. <clears throat> and, and I've been married for 42 years. This December will be 43 years. And um, to the same lovely wife. Amen. Um, I'd like to, to um, thank uh, Council Mejia for the invite and to our Council President, um, Council Ed Flynn, who I've known for years, and to um, our absence of our council, District 4, Worrell. Um, it's just glad to see everyone here in, the, in this space. And I hope that we can do all, our, all that we can to recognize that our work that we do is not for ourselves, but for the city of Boston together. And so we do uh, pray that God would strengthen you. With, all, with respect to all faith traditions, let's bow our head. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the opening session of this council. We thank you, dear God, for the Boston City Council. We thank you, Lord God, for our mayor. We thank you, Lord God, for our council president and all the counselors who are gathered here and those who are absent. We pray that you'll be with them. Father, we ask that you'll be with the outgoing counselors, Lord God, like my friend Mike Flaherty and Counselor Arroyo and Baker and Lara. And we pray, dear God, that you'll guide them to new heights as they reach out to the residents of this city and beyond. We pray that you'll touch, Lord, those who will be sworn in, uh, in, sworn in, on, in on, uh, during the month of January. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you help this council to work together. Let peace prevail. Father, I pray that peace will prevail so much so that they'll talk about it in the community, just the way they talk about when they're not working in peaceful resolutions. Father, I pray that you'll give each one of us resolve to work together to uplift this community, a community of people throughout the city of Boston that, when I say community, I mean a community of human beings that love each other and love what's best for the city of Boston. In the midst of the violence, in the midst of the housing crisis and educational challenges and a plethora of other issues, we pray to God that you would help us, Lord, to do what's best for the constituents. Help us to do what's best for those, Lord, that are struggling for day, from day to day. We have our challenges like any other city. But, Father, we do have examples of victories like other cities. And we pray to God that you'll lift high the city of Boston and this council. Bless this session and bless the work of every counselor at, that they will work towards making Boston a beloved city with respects to all faith traditions in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Could you um, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, Bishop Dickerson, and for your inspiring words, but also for the important leadership you play in this city for so many years. Um, thank you, Bishop, to you and your wonderful family as well. At this, at this time, I would like to invite um, Councilor Sharon Durkin to the podium for a special presentation. Councilor Durkin. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Um, I'd like to invite Elliot Laffer uh, up here. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge his wife, Gail Laffer, and Sue Prindle, who are in the crowd with us today. So Elliot just finished up his second term as chair of the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay, stepping down at NAB's annual meeting on September 18th. His chairmanship was a successful one over the last three years, 
I know we've only started working together recently, but his impact has been felt through the many conversations I've had in early in my tenure on the City Council. I recognize all the work NAB and Elliott in particular has done in collaboration with my predecessors in the District 8 office. Under Elliott's leadership, NAB has weathered so much, COVID, um, and he's made uh, Back Bay an incredible place to live and call home. Um, NAB has worked tirelessly to improve quality of life for residents in the Back Bay to keep it historic, beautiful, and the neighborhood that we love. They are stewards of one of Boston's most vibrant neighborhoods, um, and they do from architectural preservation to green buildings and groundwater. We've already worked together on a lot, and I know he'll continue, continue to dedicate his time to improving life in the Back Bay, but I thought 49 years of service to the Back Bay deserves recognition, so I'm really happy that we're here and uh, we have an opportunity to celebrate him today. Um, one can hardly walk through the Back Bay without feeling the impact of Elliot's contributions. To let everyone know, Elliot has not just served as the chair of NAB, but also worked for the Groundwater Trust as its first executive director, which plays an essential role in measuring and maintaining proper groundwater levels across the city to ensure the stability of the city's built environment. Um, I'm grateful to Ed Flynn. He actually gave his board seat away to me right as I joined the council, so I'm excited to continue in, in uh, Elliot's legacy as well. Um, he was also vice chair of PRUPAC as a citizen member of the steering committee of the Copley Place Project. So anytime you shop in the Back Bay, think of Elliot. Um, so I'm going to read uh, this and then I'm going to give him a second. Uh, I'll, I'll just read a couple of these whereas is that we're going to um, pass later today. Um, but I'd like to recognize Elliot Laffer for his 49 years of dedication to the Back Bay. Elliot Laffer has been an engaged resident of the Back Bay neighborhood since 1974, and Elliot first got involved in the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay as treasurer in 1977 and served his first term as chair from 1990 to 1992. And Elliot recently completed his second term as chair of NAB, serving from 2020 to 2023, supporting Back Bay residents throughout the COVID pandemic, ushering Neighborhood Association through many important discussions of city infrastructure improvement initiatives and expanding the engagement of various NAB committees such as the Green Committee and the Committee on Homelessness. And Elliot has served on many CACs and IAGs dedicating countless hours to advocating for NAB's interest in historic preservation, public access, green spaces, treasured places within the neighborhood through the city's development review process, helping developments become the best projects possible for the neighborhood. And Elliot has served as a citizen member of the steering committee of Copley Place Project, which has been a vibrant addition to the retail environment in the neighborhood. And Elliot was vice chair of PRUPAC, which was established to help develop guidelines for rebuilding of the Pru Center, Prudential Center, and has hosted millions of visitors and provided a vibrant and welcoming space to residents. And Elliot has served as the first executive director of the Boston Groundwater Trust from 2004 to 2014, which plays an essential role in measuring and maintaining proper groundwater levels across the city uh, to ensure the stability of the city's built environment. And so there, now, therefore, be it that the Boston City Council commends Elliot Laffer for his years of service and dedication to the Back Bay neighborhood. So I'm going to give him a second um, to talk and just um, share a little bit about what he's been doing over the last 49 years. Uh, but I really appreciate uh, my colleagues in um, getting a chance to celebrate him. He is the quintessential and example of what it means to be a true civic volunteer and to put your neighborhood above all else. So, Elliot? Well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> First, <laughs> First, I want to thank uh, my wife. The, the Reverend uh, spoke earlier of, of, uh, of his long-term um, marriage, but he's really a newlywed. Uh, we're married 50 years this year, and so that's, uh, that's I think, a really important accomplishment, and, uh, and Gail can claim most of the credit for it. Um, I think that one thing that I've learned over the years, and one thing that I hope we can all take uh, with us, is that Almost everybody that gets involved in civic life is well motivated. And we shouldn't question why people do things. We should work to find a way that we can get a win for everybody. Can't do it every time, 
But it's amazing how if you don't have to get everything that you want, but can get what's important to you and other people can get what's important to them, we can reach agreements. And it's worked a lot over the 49 years I've done it. I've seen it work in this council a lot, and I hope we can see it work some more. Thank you. This means a lot to me. So, um, I'd love to invite my colleagues up to take a picture with Elliot and, um, and also to take a picture of us with the resolution. Gail and Sue, definitely you should come up. Thank you, Councillor Jerkin, for bringing this wonderful civic leader into the chamber. And we have great respect for Elliot, and I'm also proud to have worked with him because I represent a, a portion of Back Bay as well. So I just want to say thank you to Elliot in the Back Bay community as well. Thank you, Councillor Jerkin. We're on to the first order of business, which is the <coughs> approval of the minutes, seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter. The chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. aye. Uh, all opposed say nay. Thank you. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communication from her honor the mayor, <coughs> Mr. Kirk. Please read docket 1539. Docket number 1539, message not authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of one million nine hundred eighty three thousand eight hundred thirty three dollars in the form of a grant for the shelter and services program twenty three awarded by the united states department of homeland security to be administered by the mayor's office of housing the grant will fund services to non-citizen migrants recently released from dhs custody to provide shelter food transportation acute medical care personal hygiene supplies and case management services and to provide funding for to non-federal entities to increase their capa capacity to shelter non-citizen migrants recently released from DHS custody, including renovations and modifications to existing facilities. Thank you. This talk at 1539, it will be referred to the <coughs> Committee on Housing and Community Development. Mr. Kirk, can you please read docket 15402, 1542. Docket number 1540, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,124,566 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 2023 comprehensive opioid stimulant and substance and abuse site-based program, also known as COSSUP grant, awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the police department. The grant will fund and support pre- and post-arrest diversion of substance users to treatment in the area of mass and cats. Docket number 1541. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $481,919 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 Burn Justice Assistance Grant local allocation awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the police department. The fund will grant, I mean, excuse me, the grant will fund a domestic violence management analyst at the Family Justice Center, a hub and center responsibility coordinator, and a technology coordinator for multiple data collection, reporting, and records management systems. 
and docket number 1542, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $446,406.09 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 24 state 911 training grant awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund the training and certification of enhanced 911 telecommunication staff. Thank you. <clears throat> These dockets, 1540, 1541, 1542, they will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Mr. Kirk, please read docket 1543. Docket number 1543. Message not authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $330,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 24 EEA Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program awarded by the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs to be administered by the Environment Department. The grant will fund Ready Boston's findings through further assessment and exploration of three design alternatives for flood risk reduction on Bennington Street in Boston and Fredericks Park, Bell Isle Avenue and Montfern Avenue in Revere. The project team aims to complete a feasibility assessment and schematic design of these alternatives to identify a preferred coastal resilience solution to advance further design that will protect Boston and Revere from coastal flooding while providing a myriad of co-benefits including stormwater management, urban heat island reduction, recreational enhancement, and the health and longevity of Bell Island Marsh. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Council President Flynn. Um, as the uh, Councilor for District 1, I was pleased to support uh, the Environment Depart Department and the City of Revere um, MVP grant, which is the Municipal Vulnerability Program uh, grant application for regional <coughs> climate resilience pr uh, projects to address coastal flood risk at Bennington Street, Fredericks Park, and Belle Isle Marsh. I'm requesting that my, uh, my colleagues uh, consider passing this modest grant of about $330,000 as uh, we all know the urgency of, of climate change and the vulnerability of East Boston. This project will advance a district scale coastal resilient solution that spans the municipalities of Boston and Revere in alignment with Climate Ready Boston's Coastal Resilient Solutions for East Boston Phase 2. It will also advance a priority project resulting in the ongoing study of Belle Isle Marsh, which is an environmental treasure in, in East Boston. I recommend everybody go there to find some peace in there crazy lives, um, being led by the Mystic River Watershed Association and the Woods Hole Group. Bennington Street has already experienced the impacts of coastal flooding as recently as the December 2022 nor'easter. This project is critical for addressing near-term flood risk that already poses a threat to the East Boston community and the safety and functionality of Bennington Street and the MBTA Blue Line in Boston. Uh, by us passing this, by the City of Boston and the City Council passing this today, it signals to the City of Revere that we are all in. So that is uh, additionally why I'm asking for my colleagues to consider uh, suspending and passing. Thank you. Thank you, Council Carter. Before we do that, I do want to ask the Chair of the Committee, Council Lara. Um, Council Coletta is seeking passage of this docket. I want to give you an opportunity to speak, Council Lara. Thank you, President Flynn. No objection from me as the chair. I would like to invite my council colleagues to suspend and pass. Thank you, Council Laura. Thank you, Council Coletta. Council Laura seeks suspension of the rules. Okay, yeah. Mr. Clerk, can you ensure the record is reflected that Council Laura is present? <laughs> council Laura is seeking suspension of the rules in passage of this docket 1543. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has passed. Mr. Clerk, we're on to docket 1544, please. Docket number 1544, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $70,172 in the form of a grant for the federal Burn Justice Assistance Grant Reallocation awarded by the United States Department of Justice passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund annual Boston address verification procedures mandated by the Massachusetts Sex Offender Registry Board. Thank you. 
This stock at 1544, it will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1545, please? Docket number 1545, message transmitting certain information under Section 17F relative to the City of Boston redistricting lawsuit passed by the City Council on September 13, 2023. Thank you. This stock at 1545, this one will be placed on file. Reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 1546, please. Docket number 1546, communication was received from Ineta Tavares, Chair of the Board of, of Election, for your approval of a report requesting and recommending early voting for the November 7, 2023 final election. On, on the wording of this docket, it should be final election, not preliminary election. Mr. Clerk. It will be updated. It will be updated. I just want to give Council Arroyo an opportunity to. Um, Council Arroyo, um, we're on docket 1546. Yes, this is the docket. Yep. Yeah. Pass that. Do, do you wish to speak on it, Council Royal? Yeah, I'll speak on that briefly. Uh, we did this previously uh, for the preliminary election. This just allows mail-in voting. Uh, we have deadlines that we have to make sure that the election department has so it wouldn't be feasible to hold hearings and working sessions and on this. So what I'm seeking here is to seek uh, a suspension and passage so that we can allow early voting uh, for our uh, municipal elections in November. Uh, Moving forward, this, that's what this would allow if we pass it and the mayor signs it, which I assume she will. Th thank you, Council Thank Royal. you. Um, Council Mejia, were you wishing to speak on this docket? The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm rising to uh, say that I am in support of um, suspending and pass, but while I have the mic, I also want to uplift that we do have a sleepy election, and I think that the elections department is going to need a lot more than just putting out the communication around early voting. I, we need to recognize that we have gone through redistricting. There's a lot of education that our community does not have in regards to where they're going to go to vote. So I am rising and putting on the record that uh, the Elections Department, uh, we need to ensure that they're going to meet the moment to make sure that particularly low-income communities and those who have usually fail to vote under normal circumstances that do not forget that there is an election um, on November the 7th. So I think that suspending and passing this with an understanding that we need to invest more um, to get the word out is something that I'd like to uh, advocate for. Thank you, Council Mejia. <laughs> Council Arroyo seeks, Council Arroyo moves suspension of the rules in passage of this dock at 1546. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, can we please read docket 1547? Docket number 1547, notice we received from the mayor the appointment of Mary Skelton Roberts as a member of the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority Board of Directors for a term expiring September 26, 2027. Thank you. This docket 1547, it will be placed on file. Report, reports of committees, Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket? 1188, please. Document number 1188, the Committee on Government Operations, to which was referred on June 28, 2023. Document number 1188, Ordinance Amending City of Boston Code, Ordinances, Chapter 12, Section 12-19, Immigrant Advancement for Public Health and Welfare, submits a report recommending the ordinance ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Royal, the chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Flynn. The Committee on Government Operations held a hearing on Tuesday, August 29th, 2023, on Docket 1188, an ordinance amending the City of Boston Code, Ordinances Chapter 12, Section 1219, Immigration Advancement for Public Health and Welfare, which was sponsored by Councilor Julia Mejia. I'd like to thank my council colleagues. Uh, Councilmember Mejia, Council President Flynn, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Fernandez Anderson uh, for attending. I'd also like to thank the administration for attending, Monique Nguyen, 
uh, Executive Director of the Mayor's Office for, of Immigration Advancement and Community Stakeholders for attending, Jonathan Goldman, who's the Executive Director for the Student Clinic for Immigrant Justice, and Myreda Klados, who's the Director of Health Justice for the Lawyers for Civil Rights. Uh, this ordinance seeks to establish the Office of Immigrant Advancement in the City of Boston, which exists. This simply codifies what exists, giving it permanence. Uh, the office shall also ensure that any service provided by a city agency or department shall be made available to all immigrants who are otherwise eligible for such service to the same extent. Such services is made available to other citizens or to citizens unless such agency is required by law to deny eligibility of such service. Uh, during the hearing, we heard from members of the administration on the feasibility of the ordinance and the current work the administration does for the respective communities. Uh, additionally, we heard from community stakeholders on the importance of this ordinance and the impact it can have for, in the city of Boston. Uh, based on information we heard at the hearing, the docket is amended from its initial filing to reflect what the office does and the services it currently offers. Uh, this proposal seeks to codify the office that has been doing this work already for many years. Uh, codifying the office will give it permanent status and reflects the city's commitment to the immigrant community. As chair of the Committee on Government Operations, I ask that the council accept the recommendation that this docket ought to pass in a new draft and I'll defer to my colleague, uh, the lead sponsor, Councilor Julia Mejia, for additional remarks, if any. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Royal. <clears throat> The Chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to thank my colleagues in advance and thank Chair Arroyo for helping us shepherd this uh, piece of legislation um, through the process and want to just thank the administration for their feedback. Um, so with that said, I am going to let you do the people's business. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Councilor Arroyo seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of this docket, 1188, in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed in a new draft. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1376 and dockets 1476 to 1479 together? <coughs> docket number 1376, the Committee on Public safety and criminal justice to which was referred on august 30th 2023 docket number 1376 message in order authorizing the city of boston to accept and expend the amount of one million dollars in the form of a grant for securing the city's continuation grants awarded by the united states department of homeland security to be administered by the police department submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass Docket number 1476, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, to which was referred on September 20th, 2023. Docket number 1476, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $850,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 20 Boston Regional Intelligence Center earmark awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 1477, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, to which was referred on September 20th, 2023. Docket number 1477, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $850,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 21 Boston Regional Intelligence Center earmark awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department, submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 1478, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, to which was referred on September 20th, 2023. Docket number 1478, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $850,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 22 Boston Regional Intelligence Center earmark awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department, submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. In docket number 1479, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, to which was referred on September 20th, 2023, docket number 1479, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept it uh, accept and expend an amount of $850,000 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 23, Boston Regional Intelligence Center earmark, awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department, submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. 
And thank you, Mr. Clerk. And before I recognize Council Flaherty, um, each council will have the opportunity to speak on these grants if they choose. I would ask all of us to direct your comments to the chair and to keep the focus on specifically on these dockets and to hopefully we all can be civil as well. The chair recognizes Council of Flaherty, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Committee on uh, Public <coughs> Safety held a hearing on the aforementioned on September the 29th. EPD Commissioner Cox, Superintendent Louis Cruz, Deputy Superintendent Gerard Cahill, Ryan Walsh is the Acting Director of Boston Regional Intelligence Center, Anthony Rizzo, Program Manager of Metro Boston Securing Cities, and Nicole Taub, Chief of Staff to the Commissioner and the BPD, all testified. Uh, in addition, uh, we had uh, several folks testifying in person and uh, via Zoom, uh, and some of those uh, also provided uh, written testimony uh, that include uh, Apple Grove Community Group, Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, Boston Medical Center, Fields Corner Civic, Little Saigon, Mayor's Office through Isaac Diablo, Muslim Justice League, Citizens for Juvenile Justice, among others. Um, with respect to docket 1376, it provides one million for securing cities continuation grants administered by BPD to fund enhancements for regional capabilities to detect and identify nuclear and radioactive materials. Uh, with respect to docket 1376, uh, Mr. Rizzo reviewed uh, the securing and cities program and explained that the funding will fund radiation detective equipment. Dockets 1476, 1477, 1478, 1479 provide uh, $850,000 each in the form of a grant from fiscal year 20 through 2023 for Boston Reason Intelligence the brick ear <coughs> earmarks. This funding will be used to expand and upgrade technology and protocols related to anti-terrorism, anti-crime, anti-gang, and emergency response. With respect to these dockets, Commissioner Cox described the BRIC and its role in providing additional tools and capabilities to solve crimes. BRIC is about collecting facts and collecting data that are used to help communities and cities that are impacted by crime. The data is used to put offices and resources in the right places, and it's vital to the department. Analyzing trends and crime prevention strategies requires this data. Reforms have been made to the gang database. They were described during the testimony, including the removal of, but be, removal of people that uh, were listed uh, that should not have been listed. BPD officials discussed the importance of educating the community about BRIC and describes its outreach in the community, which it hopes to better achieve through uh, this exact funding. Uh, this will allow for eight new analysts, which will enable BPD to increase community engagement and to better educate the public about BRIC and what they do and how helpful they are not only here in the city, but to surrounding communities. Uh, as chair, on behalf of the council, uh, was able to uh, negotiate and secure uh, from uh, BPD, from our commissioner, annual reports on spending and outcome measures, uh, as well as uh, updates, regular updates on their diversity efforts. Uh, also, um, they renewed their commitment as an open door policy, uh, an invitation to this body uh, to come over to the BRIC uh, for a tour, and you're welcome to bring uh, existing partners uh, that the BRIC currently has, or they welcome even new partners, civic associations, community groups, crime watches, uh, business associations, church leaders, uh, all of whom have an opportunity uh, to, uh, to visit uh, the BRIC and learn a little bit more about what they do. Uh, for some, they may think it's just about um, uh, identifying gangs and gang activity. They do much more than that. It's the missing child. It's Amber Alert. Uh, it's a poor soul that might have Alzheimer's or mental health illness that has wandered away uh, from an assisted living. Uh, it's solving homicides. Uh, it's <coughs> carjackings. It's uh, data analysis that are working with uh, surrounding communities. Uh, they have partnerships with this body. They have partnerships uh, with their communities through their, through, through their respective districts. So when you think about BRIC, it's not just one thing. It's so many things that separates our city uh, from uh, our counterparts across uh, the country in terms of how well we're doing it in partnership with community policing. Are we perfect? No, we're not. We identified some of those flaws. My colleagues had a number of questions uh, that were answered um, uh, throughout the course of the hearing. And in, in fact, uh, even after the hearing uh, with uh, Isaac Gabler, who also submitted testimony, uh, coming forward, making himself available, as well as um, 
uh, Ryan, um, uh, Ryan Walsh, uh, making sure that uh, all the questions uh, to the best of his ability were answered uh, and as thorough as possible. So uh, all in sum, uh, this is something that uh, clearly uh, demonstrates uh, our partnership with the Boston Police Department. It's something that they've been waiting for. Uh, before you know it, there'll be a 2024 grant before this body. Uh, I would suggest to colleagues that uh, have a little reticence uh, to, uh, to, to offer some goodwill and some faith uh, to our police partners, give them the opportunity to demonstrate um, you know, their side of the equation uh, and hold them accountable uh, and letting them know that moving forward, whether it's their grant writers or this particular earmark, that it includes some of the things uh, that folks uh, here want regarding uh, accountability and transparency. So all in all, um, I think it's, uh, it's uh, uh, appropriate to be here today and to have all these dockets um, and uh, making sure that we're giving uh, our police commissioner, uh, who, is, um, who is committed to reform, to give our Boston Police Department and to give Brick the resources that they need to carry out their function, to bring justice to those that have lost a loved one to senseless violence, to help identify areas where we could in, in see increased foot patrols and walk and talk beats and bicycles uh, and increased efforts around community policing. So uh, I urge uh, my colleagues to uh, support uh, all five of these dockets, uh, much needed funding uh, that frankly we didn't ask for, uh, but it came to us. Uh, and uh, if we continue uh, to, uh, to not approve these, at some point they'll stop coming. So other cities and towns are watching what happens today. Uh, they very much would like to be in the position to be accepting grant funds. Uh, we have an opportunity to accept five of them today, and it's my hope that uh, the council and its wisdom will pass it today. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? Please, um, please let me know. I'm going to go in, a, in order of when I see a light, so I'm going to go to... Council Baker, Council Coletta, um, Council Arroyo, and then I'll get Council Murphy. Um, again, each, each person can speak for several minutes. I'm not going to cut anyone off. I want to give everyone the opportunity to say what's on their mind, but I would ask that everyone direct their comments to the chair. The, the chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I will be a yes on all these dockets here today. I think what, um, thank the council for his, his um, you know, telling of what, what this money is going to be for, but, I, but what I didn't hear was um, what Commissioner Cox had talked about, the community, the community concept, which would bring brick out into the community so we know what they're actually working on. Uh, and I don't think that we can <clears throat> underestimate Brick's, Brick's, um, their, their uh, involvement in all the communities that surround us. I have family that are on, on different, um, in different towns on the police, and they tell me how important the Brick is to them when something happens in their, their community that they, quite frankly, don't know what's going on. First, first call is to the brick, and that's without talking about the terrorism support for the for the harbor and things like that. Brick is it's it's intelligence. We want intelligent police. We don't want the opposite of an intelligent police force. Um, so I'm just want to I just want to speak in favor of these here. And there's the state wouldn't keep sending these down here if there wasn't value in these. If they didn't think there was value for not just Boston and the surrounding communities, communities that surround us, the state wouldn't keep sending this to us. They know how important and what an integral, integral part BRIC is to keeping us all safe on many levels. And, and um, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Baker. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Council President Flynn. Um, I do just want to uh, thank everybody for their advocacy and the thoughtful questions that were asked during the, the one hearing that we had on this. 
Um, I do just want to comment on the procedural um, maneuvering that got us here because I have the mic and I uh, would like to get this on the record. But I do reject the false narrative um, that voting no earlier and having a hearing to exercise our fiduciary responsibility for oversight um, on a grant as large as this was a vote against police work. I just feel like that was perpetuated in the media and I think we all have to do a better job in, um, in clarifying that to folks that are watching. Um, I also reject this, um, this rush timeline. These grants do go back uh, to 2020, but this council, to my knowledge, hasn't had significant dialogue or conversation to review what this money would be utilized for. The hearing was informational, although it was just one conversation um, with still uh, uh, outstanding matters that we have to work through, um, and I'm committed to working through those. Um, I understand the complex history associated with the BRIC, the information sharing between BPS, the BPD, BRIC, and ICE during the Trump administration that led to the deportation of an East Boston resident was abhorrent. And I said that on the record. The BRIC has had fair criticisms in the past that it disproportionately affects black and brown men and their families. This has been backed up by lawsuits and court cases that have found that the old point system within the BRIC and underscore old point system within the BRIC has placed individuals on the gang database um, and it was faulty. It is fair to say all of those real concerns exist while also recognizing that the BRIC has stopped hate crimes, murders, sexual assaults, kidnappings, and attacks on our LGBTQ neighbors, our Jewish neighbors, and helped to inform police to make data-informed uh, arrests. That is a good thing for maintaining the public safety and criminal justice. There has been significant reforms, including the institution of the Trust Act, to make sure that the instance of the deportation never happens again. This body passed an ordinance for community oversight over surveillance. New regulations governing assessment of the database and the community comp stat initiatives are all commendable. With that said, acknowledgement of progress is not antithetical to the understanding that we still have a long way to go with some of these reforms. During the hearing, I asked the question, who watches the watchers? The answer I received was that there are now additional layers through these new reforms of managerial oversight within the BRIC. To that, I responded during the hearing and in subsequent conversations that we still need to conduct an external audit of individual records kept within the BRIC, and I still stand by that ask. Additionally, we just got the demographic data of who works within the BRIC. Uh, it says between 16 and 17 percent of the 42 individuals who work there identify as black or Hispanic. This clearly needs to change. Lived experience matters, especially when you're making decisions about subjective behaviors that meet the criteria of reasonable suspicion. Um, I just want to underscore that I really dislike the fact that we are here and uh, we don't have additional conversations. I think another one would have been helpful, especially to finalize some of the details as mentioned. I do think that having um, senior advisor Dr. Isaac Yablo uh, there on the record to talk about um, his perspective, and he has come out and endorsed this, which carries a lot of weight for me personally because he is a criminal and social justice expert. Um, and yes, the mayor herself, a progressive, a self-described -describe progressive, has endorsed these grants. They believe that this is right for the city. And so we can, and, and I'm, I'm advocating for, sta um, for having standing biannual hearings within these chambers that bring everyone on the uh, to the chamber um, on the record to ask questions and get answers to issues related to transparency and oversight. Um, this is an annual grant and it is within our power to create cadence beyond this one vote, beyond these uh, hearings that are tied to these grants. And I have gotten commitments from the administration that through these biannual hearings beyond, um, beyond the grants, they'll continue to work with us to take the lid off the brick. This includes a reviewing of the current audits that have happened at the state and federal level, which I think is super important to understand how effective those have been, and establishing standards for new audits moving forward. Um, this is not work that will happen overnight or weeks. It'll take months. But without communication, we don't have anything. Um, and I, I think I've laid out a pretty clear case, case as to why I'm voting yes on this. But I do agree that there needs to be more um, there needs to be more conversations and discussions around this. So, thank you. Thank you, Council Aquetta. The chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, city's coming before us and asking us to pass nearly three million dollars or more. Actually, I think somewhere around three point four uh, for the gang database for Brick. Uh, Brick has not provided to date any actual measurable for their impact. We hear over and over again, they help with this, they help with that, but they don't present any measurables. 
Brick, as recently as last year, had a federal judge, uh, federal panel of judges make a determination that uh, the flaws in that database, including its reliance on an erratic point system built on unsubstantiated inferences, was unreliable. Uh, we've seen the harm that that has done, leading to the deportation, as Councilor Coletta has mentioned, of an East Boston resident. However, I've received calls over the last several days from uh, immigration attorneys still in practice uh, who are letting me know that even though their clients have been purged in these recent purges uh, that the gang database touted of names, that Department of Homeland Security still submits their former gang database classification as evidence and it is still being used within immigration courts to remove them. Uh, we've also received no real uh, solid uh, uh, commitments to no longer participating in handing over these documents and handing over these uh, gang database inferences in, in, into uh, immigration court. And for those who aren't versed in immigration court, uh, immigration court's different than criminal courts. Criminal courts, the burden of proof is on the government. In an immigration court, the burden of proof is on the person before them. And so if you are on a gang database uh, and you can still get on the gang database largely through an FIO uh, field, uh, review, much of it is just guilt by association. Who you are around, who you are with, where you live, what transportation you take, what school you go to, all of these things and who are around you impact whether or not you get points, impact whether or not you get on this list. Uh, things as simple as non-criminal activity. Uh, I have FIOs that involve uh, children playing at basketball courts. FIOs about a man who uh, at 19, I guess we call him a man, went to uh, a laundry mat in East Boston that allegedly was frequented by MS-13, and so his usage of that uh, laundry mat was flagged. Uh, we currently have a gang database right now as we speak that's under investigation by our Attorney General, currently under investigation right now. The, the Attorney General is currently investigating the gang database for racial discrimination, and it's currently investigating the U-Strike Task Force, which relies on that gang database for racial dis discrimination and abuses of civil rights right now as we speak. Uh, beyond all of those things uh, that are incredibly concerning, I will note that I was deeply concerned that when, re when questions were posed to the commissioner regarding discrimination of this unit and the discrimination allegations, that his response was that he was unclear how they could discriminate because they're not hiring. It's not a hiring uh, organization, so he doesn't understand how discrimination applies here. Uh, I found that to be incredibly problematic. And for those reasons and more, I will be voting no on this BRIC grant money. I don't believe it makes us safer. They provided no metrics, no evidence that it makes us safer. They have continued to uh, cut into issues when we're talking about whether it was decision, the, the court decision in 2019 or the court decision in 2022 uh, that found them to be unreliable and erratic. Uh, they haven't proven their worth uh, and the fact that they're currently under investigation for possible civil rights abuses and racial discrimination makes it impossible for me to vote for those grants today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. The Chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I would like to just start off to take a moment to recognize Ms. Myrtle Huggins, who many of us in this room know and um, and across the city as a fierce community advocate for her neighborhood in Mattapan. Last night at her Apple Grove meeting, and you mentioned, Chair Flaherty, that the Apple Grove Community Group was part of um, the work with this BRIC grants. Um, she suffered a medical emergency, and thank God for the first responders who were there on the scene. Um, Officer Sean Harris, Officer Nadia Sikanalfi, Sergeant Joe DeVito, John Burroughs, and Lieutenant Henry Perkins from the Boston Fire and many others who jumped in and saved your life. So please just join me in praying for Ms. Myrtle Huggins. Um, with that being said, I do um, believe that providing the Boston police with adequate tools and information to keep our city safe is a threshold issue for policymakers. <coughs> it's quite literally what we were sent here to do. These grants will provide funding for intelligence gathering, data, and insight at the block level into the crimes that are harming our city, often in our most underserved neighborhoods. This is more than $3 million to make our streets and our neighborhoods safer that we have left on the table for too many years now. I believe it's our job as city councilors to advocate for our constituents to keep them safe 
to best leverage our resources to improve their quality of life. A vote to enhance safety on our streets and in our schools to me is one that I'll be proud to take today. So thank you, President Flynn. Thank you, Council Murphy. The chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, after only one hearing for the approval of over uh, $3.4 million in grants to the BRIC and many remaining unanswered questions, I remain critical of simply approving these funds due to a lack of transparency and accountability. We here on this body routine, routinely approve grants to the Boston Police Department, routinely and unanimously are approving grants all of the time to support the work of the Boston Police Department, to support the work of community safety. That this grant has all of these questions begs us to pause, to do the work that we are called to do as city councilors, to hold government accountable. Without more review, there is no effective mechanism to hold the brick accountable for misconduct and mistakes, and we've heard about it. We've heard about the deportation, we've heard about uh, court cases that have found problems with the gang database. This is not me just relying on what has happened in the past, although that is important, that we have had past city councilors who have not been able to get information out of the brick and for that very reason voted down this grant. We had court cases before and after that have found the brick to be problematic. We need to make sure that we have checks and balances. And without checks and balances, we risk that the BRIC will again overstep its mandate and infringe upon civil liberties, and that's too great. We have a responsibility to make sure that we are not saying, oh, we didn't know and something bad happens. This is the time. This is the time for us to slow down and do the work of accountability. The first question that I asked when we had this hearing was one about trust, and are we there? And there are areas where we are at that point of trust as demonstrated by our ready approval of a number of grants on a number of occasions for the police department. Here, there are too many unanswered questions. Many of the questions I asked at the hearing. 90 minutes before this meeting started, we got some responses that are incomplete, that talk about when I asked for RFP applications, including information and background all years, we're missing it for 2020, we're missing it for 2022, we're missing it for 2023. We cannot, I cannot, in good conscience, say that I am comfortable with the, approve, uh, with the alleged improvements of the BRIC based on incomplete information, based on simply one hearing. BRIC, like many other intelligence centers, relies on collecting vast amounts of data, including information on individuals who may not be suspected of any criminal activity. Another question that I asked, based on the information not had complete answers to, regarding the re reasonable suspicion standard under Rule 335. Now more than ever, we must require government to provide the necessary transparency to ensure that operations are up to par with our high legal and ethical standards. As you are the fundamental cornerstones of a, res uh, of a responsive government. Furthermore, the public has a right to know how data is collected, who has access to it, and how it's used. We're not there yet. The hearing did not provide enough information. There were important voices that were missing from the dialogue. To foster confidence in BPD and the BRIC, it's imperative that we continue ongoing dialogue with the police department, with BRIC, with the lack of transparency, and challenging ourselves as an oversight body and the public to hold BRIC accountable. We heard that it's just facts and with the BRIC, it's false. During the hearing, they talked about how they rely on quantitative data and qualitative data. Qualitative data is not factual. Qualitative data is based on bias and often implicit bias, which is a problem which also relates to the, de the demographic makeup of the BRIC. While the attentions and goal behind the BRIC are commendable in a lot of instances, and my private conversations with uh, Dr. Isaac Yablo testified to that, I continue to have serious concerns that if we approve these grants, we validate and perpetuate systems of discrimination and prejudice that threatens the safety, civil liberty, and privacy of black, brown, immigrant, communities. This is why we have to be cautious and scrutinize these funds. And so today, I still have too many unanswered questions. I want to note for the record that as a black woman who grew up in this city 
in Mattapan, Mattapan was referenced, in Mattapan, where my father was robbed at gunpoint outside of our home, that community safety is central and important to the work that we do here in the city. It is important to me. But what is important to me also as an elected city councilor is my job and my responsibility for oversight. And we aren't there yet. We've had one hearing. We've had one hearing about these grants that have been problematized repeatedly in the past. And so we have more work to do. Um, and I, I, I just want to repeat that I have faith in the commissioner who is here with us and his leadership. There are areas where, again, we trust, and there are areas where we have a lot more growth to do, and I think BRIC and the, ga uh, BRIC and the gang database is one of them, both as an elected official, as a lawyer, as a black woman. I cannot support these grants today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Luijan. <clears throat> the chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, where do I start? I want to take a moment to personalize a little bit what the BRIC does, as I believe that I um, am one of the only counselors who has experience with the BRIC on the other end of it. When I was a street worker, and I was a street worker for four years, started in Mattapan uh, on Norfolk Street first, and then was moved to the South End where I work with young people in Villa Victoria and in Lenox. And I got to see firsthand the damage that a brick classification does to a young person who is trying to turn their life around. There are numerous issues with this grant. There are numerous issues with the way that the brick does their work as have already been highlighted by so many of my council colleagues. But I really want to call on us to think about the human impact of what we are trying to fund at this moment. That if we cannot have a spine for police reform, unless there is a video of a murder or a video of misconduct, that we need only tragedy to stay steadfast in our commitment to the very, very small progress that we've made as a city on police reform. We have not done a lot. And in a city council that prior to this was much less diverse, much, much less progressive, has already taken a look at these grants and said no. To look at ourselves as a body, and say that we are the most diverse, to say that we are the most progressive, we are calling ourselves progressive, including the mayor, in name only. This is a regressive step. Cities all over the country are completely abolishing their gang databases, and we are being asked to expand their funding and expand their reach into the most vulnerable communities that are here in the city of Boston. Mayor Wu sent the council, through intergovernmental relations, a letter where she outlines all of the steps that we've taken in order to make this something that is functional or something that we should be accepting or that the community should be accepting. One of the details of the letter that was sent to us by Mayor Wu, she outlined the creation of the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. Early on this year, there was a report that was released that showed that the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency has yet to uphold one single civilian complaint. In that letter from Mayor Wu was also outlined that we've removed so many people from the gang database, as if removal from the gang database somehow shifts the impact of the tool itself, not just for black and brown communities, but for immigrants, and particularly in the recent times for our trans siblings and for the LGBTQ community. When we had a hearing here on the Boston City Council, when we talked about the white supremacist attacks that were coming onto this city, to our trans community and to the LGBTQ community, the Boston Police Department had no intelligence that would help them make sure that we were keeping those communities safe. And that should be a signal to all of us here on the council who is being surveilled by BRIC. It is not something that is being implemented equitably, and we are leaving many, many people not only harmed by the BRIC, but unprotected by the quote unquote intelligence that we are gathering here. There was also the mention of the Oversight and Surveillance Ordinance. The Oversight Surveillance Ordinance has also not been implemented properly. We are required as a city council to review the surveillance uh, uses of the Boston Police Department and to approve them every single year. Last year, this body, without any review at the end of the year, voted to approve all of the surveillance practices for the Boston Police Department without doing our job. 
We have not reviewed not just the brick, but any of the surveillance practices of the Boston Police Department for approval. And they continue to be used as they are now. The money, as Council Region mentioned, continues to be approved. And this body has not done their job as an oversight body, particularly for um, any of the oversight uses for the Boston Police Department. If we are voting in favor of this grant, we are no doubt going to expand the power and the reach of BRIC, particularly in the most vulnerable communities. The communities that are most directly impacted by the violence that we say we are going to stop are going to continue to be further marginalized. I have been in numerous, hundreds of court dates with young people who I've worked with as a street worker, where their designation as a quote unquote gang member in that database has been used whether it be a first offense or whether it be a third offense, to either bring down a harsher sentence or to not give them the opportunity to correct a one-time mistake. It doesn't matter how many times people hear Brick say that they are not being used, they are. Those designations are being used in court. They're even being used inside of BPS for our BPS students who are not being allowed to return to their school communities because of it and they're being separated from it. We are moving backwards on police reform. It is 2023 and this body is moving backwards on police reform. We should be not only moving funding away from BRIC, we should be looking at how to get rid of the gang database altogether. I think it's already been said here that BRIC has many other uses, that it does anti-terrorism work and so on and so forth. The gang database is not the only part of it, but we have yet to actually effectively look at that. So my, I'm obviously not going to be voting for that. I think that there have been, I want to make a comment about the invitations to take ride-alongs with Brick or to come down to Brick and visit Brick and see what's happening there. If you want to see the actual impact of a tool or an intervention, you don't go to the people who are in power implementing that on people. You go and you stand outside with all of the young people who have been negatively impacted by having their name on there. You don't have a ride-along with Brick. You go out to a neighborhood and you talk to young people who are being disproportionately impacted and you talk to them about how aggressive the Youth Violence Task Force is. You talk to them about how mistreated they are by the gang unit. You talk about every single one of the interactions that they have in their neighborhoods by way of living there, hanging out with the wrong people. And that is what's going to give you an actual open vision of what is happening. I am a little discouraged that it is evident that this vote is going to fall along racial lines. And so if we cannot listen to the facts about how ineffective this tool is, if we cannot listen to the advocates, if we cannot listen to the people who have been disproportionately impacted by it, and if we can't listen to the counselors of color who are saying how, not only that we don't have all the information that we need to pass on this, but the impact that it has on communities, on the people who look like me, then my request is that when we talk about being allies, that when we talk about being against white supremacy, then when we talk about racial justice in the city, that we pay attention to what that looks like in practice. It is a terrible, terrible message that we are sending to the people of the city if we are gonna pass these grants. And not only are we gonna pass these grants, but that our votes are gonna fall along racial lines. It is further reinforcing that as much progress as we say that we have made, we actually have not made any progress. And so I think that I appreciate that people feel like they've gotten some commitments from the administration, but the commitment that we also got from the administration was that we were gonna abolish the gang database. And here we are instead. It's one of the commitments that won the mayor my vote a vote that I will not soon be, be giving her again because of this kind of regressive policy, because of this kind of about face that impacts the communities of people who look like me that are often not heard here. So I am going to be voting no to pass these grants and I encourage all of my council colleagues to not take us backward. We do not have to go backward on police reform. We do not have to do this. We can have a spine, we can stay steadfast in our commitment and maintain at least some of the small progress that we've made here in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lara. The chair recognizes Councilor Worrell. Councilor Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn. Um, I have a record of supporting hardworking officer, police officers. 
I've advocated for public safety measures like more walking beats, sector cars, fixed posts, code 19s, and rapid response cars. Um, and I'd like to point out that our city's department hasn't seen any decrease in funding in the past few years. But I can in good conscience support this increase in funding for the BRIC unit today. The BRIC has been called out by the federal courts, sued by the state attorney general. In some corners, its effectiveness to fight crime has been called into question. While its gang database has been cleaned up a little bit, it's still not enough. The, da the database has been proven to be discriminatory toward the black and brown community, the community that makes up majority of my district. There are not, not enough safeguards and guardrails in place at the, at the brick to increase funding right now. The unit needs a process for increased accountability on its gang database and how it's used before it can increase funding. The unit needs to show a more diverse workforce before it can increase funding. The unit needs to establish a new database focused on hate crimes that would target the rising threat of white supremacy before it can see increased funding. The unit needs to continue to reform the point system that it feeds its, that feeds its gang database before it can see increased funding. We need more hearings with diver, divergent programs, black male advancement, uh, the working groups that are there around public safety, the black men's commission before we can increase funding. Every day I hear from my residents in my district that don't feel safe. Matter of fact, in my immediate neighborhood with my parents, my partner, my brother, eight-month-old son, nephew, niece, cousins, and aunt live, at least three homicides have happened in my first term, with the latest just hundreds of feet from my front door. Safety is a top priority for me. But when we talk about police funding, I want to ensure that we are funding the work that our communities most need. I've had a flood of, of complaints and 911 calls for more than a year about late night partying um, outside on Old Road. And two weeks ago, the police put a patrol car, patrol car at the end of the street. And the results so far have been great. And the situation that has been solved. It's the on the ground police and that response to these communities and neighborhoods that is most effective. And that's the type of police work that I'm looking to fund right now. My vote is not an anti-police vote. We have the best police department in the nation. This is a vote that is looking to get back into the room to workshop reform. And until the BIC implements necessary safeguards and accountability, I must vote no on this grant. Thank you. Thank you, Council Wuerl. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, in 2020, I had to take a vote. I'm here in the City Council that I still think that I have been traumatized by it. Um, the narrative about the body at the time um, just really was uh, just not uh, true. And when my council colleague and um, the mayor reintroduced this um, to the council for consideration, I was really surprised because I thought we had already been there and done that. So I was really surprised to know that we were bringing back the past. And so one of the first recommendations that I asked my colleague was to um, host another hearing and to include other voices um, because there was this discussion about the fact that the first go round, it was just a bunch of advocates, I guess it was called, that were asked to testify and it was lopsided, which now two or three years later was similar. It was just one voice here dominant in terms of the particular hearing. So I asked for an opportunity to bring in the Black Male Advancement, the Black Men's Commission, um, people who are living the realities, uh, to have a robust conversation so that we can all, um, you know, really unpack what the moment is calling for. And I was told that we would take it under consideration. And obviously that consideration did not go any further. As someone who prides myself as the official interpreter and translator for those who are watching us here on the city council, I think it's really important for us to understand the politics that are at play. And so it is interesting that we are now yet again falling on a vote that will again uplift 
the deep racial divide that exists here in the city of Boston, that exists here in the city council, that continues to haunt us in how we lead. And we say we are for black and brown people and immigrants, but yet when it's time for us to stand up for them, we don't. And I think it's really important for us to be really mindful of what we say publicly, what we say privately, and how we show up for those that we serve. And for me, the good thing about me is that I can lead without fear. Because I know that for me, I don't need the seat to fight for my people. And so I don't have anything to lose with the votes that I take. Because I take those votes based on my values. And so with that, I think it's really important for us to recognize that all we're asking for consideration to the chair is to give us an opportunity to have a robust conversation, to have another hearing so that we can unpack the data, so that we can have an opportunity to really once and for all have a conversation in which everyone is seen and heard. I don't think that that's an unfair request. And I've heard it from a number of my colleagues here that they would be willing right, to advocate for a pause and a second hearing so that we could do the people's work. So I am, yet again, asking for publicly an opportunity for us to have this conversation. And I don't think the hearing should be in the Public Safety Committee. It should be in the Government Accountability, Transparency, and Accessibility, because what we're talking about is government accountability and transparency. And so I don't think, for me, voting on a and that's a lot of money that we're doling out right now. And I don't think it's fair to say that we are anti-police just because we want to unpack the data a little bit further. I don't think it's fair for people to say that we're anti-police because we don't know the racial makeup of those who are working in that space. How many analysts of color do we have? Right, so I do applaud and appreciate the fact that we have a black commissioner and a Latino superintendent, but that's still not enough for what this moment calls for. When we're thinking about the harm that we are causing people and the folks that testified here who have been traumatized by that database and by that surveillance, I think we owe it to those that we serve to pause. And I also think it's unfair for us to continue to pit communities against each other. So here we have black, brown, undocumented immigrants, right? It seems like then we're going up against, you know, other marginalized groups. We shouldn't have to choose between one or the other because all of them need to be protected and served. But it is evident to me that when it comes to communities of color, we're always having to fight to be seen fight to be protected. And here we have an opportunity to slow this down. The legislative cycle does not end until December. I don't understand why we need to make this vote today unless it's a political ploy, unless people are looking for political cover. And I'm not here for that. And so for me, you know, with all due respect to the commissioner, and I'm really excited about your leadership, but for me, it's more important to have a partnership with you all in a way that makes me feel safe in the city of Boston. Because right now, right now, I don't feel safe even coming into this chamber. And so with that, I'm just going to be completely honest. I think we should, and I'd like to put it on the floor for us to consider a pause. And I'm asking the chair to consider hosting another hearing so that we can do the people's business publicly in a transparent manner. That is what I'm asking for today. That's what I'm asking for today, President Flynn. Thank you, Council Mejia. I will give Council of Flaherty an opportunity to respond at the appropriate time. Council Mejia, I don't want to cut you off. Are you still speaking? I'm waiting to hear a response. I am asking respectfully for an opportunity
based on my conversations with my colleagues, many of which are in agreement and willing to consider an opportunity to have a second hearing so that we can really have a conversation so that we can make an informed decision, not based on hypotheticals. So I'm asking again, if we're willing to have a second hearing so that we can make informed decisions and vote for something that makes sense to us all. Right now, I do not think it's fair to ask us to take a vote when there's still so many things that are unanswered. It is not fiscally responsible for us to do that. And I'm asking the chair, again, on the record, if he is willing, and I understand that we've waited long enough, but the legislative cycle ends in December, and respectfully, I am asking for consideration for a second hearing to give the BRIC an opportunity to gather the data, to unpack the things that we're still waiting to learn more about, and to give an opportunity for those who have been deeply impacted an opportunity to have their voices heard. And so I don't think it is unreasonable for me to ask for that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. As I mentioned, I am giving Councilor Flaherty the opportunity to speak at the end. However, Council Flaherty, at this time, would you respond to the question from Council Mejia? I know it's not the appropriate time to do it, but out of respect to Council Mejia, I do want to give her the opportunity to ask that question. Violence, violence in our city, and to give our police commissioner in the brick the resources that they need. They needed it yesterday. In fact, they've been asking for it since 2020. So the time is not to have additional hearings. We had a very thorough and exhaustive hearing where everyone was treated fairly with dignity and respect. Everybody went over their time allotment, frankly. Uh, in addition, we heard from multiple different groups and organizations. For those that weren't here, the newer members, this is probably our fourth, maybe our fifth hearing on brick over the years. So not a case of first impression. Uh, I would recognize uh, that had been mentioned. We, uh, folks need to realize, and again, particularly for the newer members, Mr. President, this is not legislation. This is an earmark. And there's a difference. Legislation, we get to tweak and twist and turn. This is an earmark that's been earmarked, that we have to satisfy certain criteria, which if, during the discretion of our mayor and our police commission and police department and brick, if they adhere to those guidelines, that's how we get the funding. So I want, for those that are watching at home, thinking that we get to sort of twist and turn this thing and add and subtract, we don't get to do that. This is not legislation for new amendments. This is an earmark, which is very specific. It's tailored to the brick for a specific purpose. Uh, and they've been waiting since 2020. Um, and uh, just to maybe tie it in, and I know I'll appreciate the opportunity to maybe do a uh, conclusion at the end. I, I know that in deference to our colleague who has not had the opportunity to speak, um, you know, uh, the mayor was referenced. Uh, the mayor is the CEO of the city. The mayor has a vantage point that we don't have collectively as a body. It's just, it's, that's just the power of the office. And uh, she was elected overwhelmingly, frankly, a mandate through the chair. She would uh, mop the floor with anybody in this room, including others, if challenged. And the body should be asking, how can we partner with our mayor and our new police commission? Uh, how can we meet them halfway? Give them the opportunity to demonstrate that today's brick is not the brick of two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Recognize collectively, as adults, recognize that they've made reforms. And embrace those reforms. Recognize that no one's perfect. Brick is not perfect. This city council has been demonstrated weekly is not perfect. But working together in partnership, this is an opportunity for the Boston City Council to go on record, meet brick halfway and say, hey, we're not completely convinced, but we want to give you the benefit of the doubt. You have made some changes. You have made some reforms. We want to applaud that. We want to give you a little extra, a little more wiggle room here. However, we're going to watch you like a hawk. And moving forward, we are going to ask for the things that we've asked in the hearing. That we have, <coughs> Brick is open. They'll meet with anyone. And I urge my colleagues, if you haven't been over to Brick, get over there and bring community residents and business leaders over there. They're open to that. If each council here has not been over there, do that. But also, meet with them monthly. My district colleagues in particular should be meeting with BRIC monthly. 
What's going on? What are you working on? This is, these are the calls we're getting in our office. What type of 911 call? How do we collaborate? This is an opportunity to be collaborative. This is an opportunity for all of us to exercise leadership to say, hey, listen, we know no one's perfect. We know that there's been flaws in the past. They've been identified here by colleagues. But this is a different brick. This is a different police commissioner. This is a different mayor who are moving forward with reform. Give them the opportunity. Give them the opportunity. That's all they're asking. Oh, guess what? You get your pound of flesh again, because in a couple months, the 2024 grant will be here. I won't be. Hopefully, they won't have to wait another four years to get 24, 25, 26, and 27. But the issues that you're identifying here, work with the commissioner and his team. Work with his grant writers. Try to have some things that you want put into the next grant. We can't change the grant. It's not legislation. I know that might be new to some of the folks that are here. But those are the facts. And at the end of the day, brick helps solve crimes, particularly violent crime, homicides. Brick brings justice and some solace, a little bit of peace, and a little bit of closure to those that have had a loved one killed in the streets of Boston. In addition to that, they do so many other things. Give them an opportunity to make right on what they said they were going to do in this hearing. Hold them accountable. We have a process, folks. It's called 17F. 17F. Every week, you can file a 17F on brick. Every week. Put your money where your mouth is. Don't be a detractor. Don't be an obstacle. Be a partner. Work with the police commissioner in his department. Boston success stories, if you've heard me say it once, you've heard me say it a thousand times. Boston success stories are built on partnerships. We, the Boston City Council, have an opportunity to partner with the Boston Police Department, to partner with the mayor of the city of Boston, to bring about this change, to make brick work for everybody. Some don't want brick altogether. I hear you. I get it. Some want brick altogether. I hear you. And then there's folks in the middle that have questions and concerns. Don't be an obstacle. Be a partner. Let's have this be a two-way street. Give them the resources they need to keep our city and our neighborhood safe. Ask for the things that you think you need or you want in your district. Collaborate. Collaborate, folks. Work together. Pull it together. Work together. So through the chair, at the appropriate time, I'll be moving the question to answer the question. But there was a lot of stuff going on here. And I want to let folks know that we had a, we had a hearing. It was properly notified. People attended. People were treated with dignity and respect. People sent in letters. In letters from everywhere. Business community, health centers, you name it, we got it. A lot of folks weighed in on this. And for those that weren't here in previous years, we've had multiple hearings on the brick. And if anyone in here can testify to it, me. Today's brick is not the brick of two years ago, not the brick of five years ago, not the brick of 10 years ago. Give them an opportunity to earn the trust and respect that we're willing to offer them. Thank you. Thank you, Council Flaherty. I do want to remind, I do want to remind the audience, please do not applaud. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Um, Council Mejia, I have given you plenty of time, but again, I want to be respectful to you. If you would like to conclude your comments, I, I want to give you the opportunity, Council Mejia. Thank you, Mr. President, and I really do appreciate my colleague and, you know, you made some really important points in regards to partnership, so in good faith, in terms of partnership, I'd love to see, um, and, I, and I appreciate the fact that you're saying no, but I think partnerships is a two-way street, and I think there were a lot of folks who were not invited. I think the Black Male um, Advancement of Office is definitely instrumental, because a lot of the decisions that we're going to make today are going to impact black men. Um, and so I think that in the fairness of, of democracy and creating space for all people to be heard, their voice was missing from this space. You know, um, the Muslim Justice League was also um, unavailable to be part of the panel, they, even though they were invited to be public testimony. I just feel like we do not have all of the right voices at the table. And I have to say, you know, I lost a cousin to a triple homicide, and that is still unsolved. My niece lost 
the father of her son uh, in 2020, and that um, homicide is still unsolved. I mean, so while I appreciate the whole idea of safety, there's still a lot of unsolved homicides here in the city of Boston. So yet again, we have to really think about who are we protecting and serving. And I still have some concerns, and I really want us to understand that being adults and being um, leaders require us to show up for those that we serve and to go on the record for the things that we want to push. And I am going to continue to push for us to be transparent, for us to be accountable, and for us to recognize that this is not about anti-police. This is not about anti-police. This is about creating space for people who have been harmed by the police to have a voice in a decision that will impact their lives. And so with that, you know, it is unfortunate that the political theater that this body continues to demonstrate um, is just really telling about the times that we are in. The way we behave matches the national political climate. And Boston, true to its form, we keep showing up that way. And so I think, and I'm all about partnership, but partnership is a two-way street. I don't think partnership and being um, dismissive of the voices of the Black Men's um, Commission and other groups that have been marginalized feels like a partnership to me. It feels oppressive. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman here. The two remaining colleagues, um, Councilor Durkin and Councilor Braden, I wasn't sure who. Okay, I'm gonna go to Councilor Braden and then I'm gonna go to Councilor Durkin. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I really appreciate all my colleagues' comments and concerns regarding the, the brick. Um, the reality is that there is a troubling history. Uh, the brick is not perfect. <coughs> but as I listen to the testimony and in conversations with the Commissioner Cox, um, I want to get to a place where we can agree that there's been problems and then set our intentions to fix and improve the system and make it better. I also hear and understand my colleagues justified anger and frustration with the fact, with the history and the fact that there, with regard to the gang database, there's lots of room for improvement. But in my conversations, you know, one thing, we are living in a, an incredibly complex and fast changing world. And the brick doesn't just deal with gang, with the gang database is one small part of what the brick does. We're seeing an increase in anti-immigrant, anti-LGBT, anti-Semitic, neo-Nazi activity. We're seeing increasingly sophisticated financial scams that are targeted at elders and immigrants who English is not, they have limit, limited English skills. There's lots to deal with. And I know that this body has scrutinized and critiqued the BRIC for, repeatedly over the past few years. I'm encouraged by the fact that we have a new police commissioner who is committed to police reform. And at this point in time, I want to join, I want to join uh, the call for increased transparency and accountability. I want to see an annual report of the BRICS activities. Uh, I want to understand the range of the activities that they've been in, engaged in, expenditures, um, and what the line items, how is the money being spent, the diversity of the workforce, the level of community engagement, and outcomes. I think we're right in asking, what about all those unsolved homicides? Why are we not getting better results? 
and with all this incredible intelligence apparatus, why are we not getting better results? Those are the hard questions, but I think as a body, we should ask those questions, but we also in this moment need to uh, see if we can be partners in reforming the police department and in reforming the BRIC to make it better in serving all of the communities in our city. I support uh, the call for biannual hearings to hold the BRIC accountable and to understand its activities and scrutinize their outcomes. We want, to, we want them just to have more than just a passing grade. We want them to excel. And we have a duty to protect all of our communities. As Councillor Flaherty already mentioned, these grants are retro, grants that have already been offered that, that we have to accept, accept and expend. The reset button is going to happen next year. We're going to start writing grants again. I think we should be involved in, in trying to curate uh, and have those grants targeted uh, to address the needs and the concerns of our neighbourhoods. It's not acceptable that so many people of colour in our city die. It's not acceptable that so many of missing uh, young people of colour, LGBT, trans, black people, their, their disappearance is ignored and not investigated in a timely way. We have lots of room for improvement here. I started off in this conversation going all over the map in terms of will I support this, will I not support this. At this moment, given all the challenges we have and given very real concerns about some of the shortcomings in the BRIC, I am planning to vote yes. But I do agree that we should be coming in here and having those biannual hearings and make it, and, and the brick cannot not turn up. Like historically, you know, ignoring us, not coming in here and talking about these issues and trying to come up solutions with solutions and reforms that the people want. Not turning up is not an option. We want to work and make this better for everyone so that we have safer communities all of our communities, but especially our communities of colour, are safer. Maybe I'm naive, but that's where I stand right now. I want to work with the police department, I work to want to work with my colleagues to make this better. And I think we can make it better, but we have to work together to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. The Chair recognises Councillor Durkin. Councillor Durkin, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, communities of color have, in Boston have a rightful distrust of law enforcement. Their experiences highlight that community safety is applied differently in these communities. It's incumbent upon the city and our police force to recognize the ways in which those disparities are engendered. Intelligence gathering is part of that. In allocating these funds to the BRIC, we must remain steadfast in holding Commissioner Cox and others accountable to make sure community safety uplifts our communities. So often, our anti-terrorism measures have served to terrorize. In allocating these funds under the mayor, this commissioner, and under the new reforms and changing police department, I am confident that we will not follow a similar harmful path, and this money will be put to productive uses. I toured the brick a little over two hours. I really encourage my colleagues to do the same, and um, I got a chance to see what they do. I got a chance to read Isaac Gabo's letter. I got a chance to read the mayor's letter. Um, and I know that the change and pace of change is not fast enough. I know that. And I want to highlight that just because I will be voting yes on uh, these five dockets today, it doesn't mean that I don't share the same um, critiques and uh, things that my colleagues described in their remarks. Um, I think an annual report and watching what they do with these funds 
and how they work in community over the next year is going to be a really important part of making sure that us as the city council is holding the brick accountable. Um, but uh, I will be voting yes today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Durkin. Did everybody get an opportunity to speak? Before I ask Council Flaherty to speak, I'm going to speak uh, briefly. Councilor from the floor is yours. Thank you, Council Royal. This morning, I had the opportunity to be at the National Coffee with the Cop in the South End and had the chance to listen to men and women of the police department, but also residents of the South End of Roxbury as well. And what their concerns were it was, a, it was a great opportunity for me to hear these concerns. Um, the brick was mentioned by several people. Uh, the people mentioned that community policing works. Others mentioned that we don't have enough police on the streets and that they want more police. But what I, what I do know is that there are still concerns from some of my colleagues about, about the brick, but I think we are able to work together and address them moving forward. And it's about working together. It's about treating each other fairly, treating each other with, re with respect. But I do know that the brick plays an incredible role in our city. And most major police departments across the country have such a intelligence gathering department where they're able to address crime. They're able to prevent crime. But we also have to ensure that the men and women of Boston Police have the necessary tools and resources to keep our city safe. And I think that's what the residents of this city are asking us to do today. Thank you, Councilor Royal. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Councilor Royal, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. And just for um, clarification, there's, there's five grants, Chair. chair. Um, one is on the nuclear and then the other four are on, you know, the anti-gang database and, and the others, correct? correct? Awesome. And I just want to say, like, in terms of partnership and, you know, this not being a, you know, I, I will be voting no on 1476 to 1479, but I will be voting in favor and to making sure that our police department does get uh, the resources in 1376, uh, which is a million dollars um, for the uh, nuclear detection uh, identify and report. So this is us, um, well, this is me saying that I do believe in partnership and making sure that our police department has the resources that it needs. Thank you. Thank you, Council Wuerl. I'm going to, I, I, I do want to offer a brief comments at the beginning. I did say each person would get the opportunity to speak for as long as they wanted. I said it could be two minutes, it could be three minutes, but I, I made it clear that no one would be cut off. I think I gave everybody that opportunity. I'm gonna go directly to Council Flaherty to offer final comments and how. Mr. President, I'll make this really easy. Move the question. Thank, thank you, Council Mejia. Thank you, Council Louis Jean. I didn't recognize Council Worrell. I understand he was speaking before I got up here. Um, but I did give everybody the opportunity to speak. Everybody was on record on exactly what they wanted to say. But we're not going back and forth. We're going to keep the discussion moving forward. We're going to take a vote. The chair, the chair, the chair, the chair. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. I too want to rise and um, echo my colleague's sentiment. In the spirit of partnership, I'll also be voting in favor of one of those dockets, not all five. So. Th 
Okay, just wanted to note for the record, I'm willing to partner with you all. Thank you, Council Mejia. And we will take each docket individually, so your vote will be noted on each individual docket, and it will be a roll call vote, so everybody will be recorded appropriately. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council? I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to move the question. I think. I'm, I'm, so, I, I th so I think, Mr. Mr. President, I'm, I'm, through the, through the, the board, chair think, recognizes Council Flaherty. I think what folks want to do, I, I think they want to go on the record. I think they want to go on the record of being in support of 1376. I think that may be the issue. That's not, they'll, that's not. All right, they'll, I'll, they'll, they'll have the opportunity Council to do that. Here, I'm going to they'll have ask. the opportunity to do that. But in the beginning of the meeting, Mr. President, you made it clear that everyone gets to speak once, and that as the leads, as the chair, I get final remarks before we move to the vote. What I've done, though, is I've already moved the question, and that has been seconded. So right now, before us, we have five docket numbers: numbers 1376, 1476. 1477, 1478, 1479, pursuant to council rules and Robert's Rules of Order. There is a question in front of the body right now, which is to move the question, second it. I would like a roll call vote through you to the clerk. Thank you, Mr. President. Th thank you, Council Flaherty. Rules. We're going, to, we're going to take a roll call vote on each docket individually, and I'm going to ask the clerk to take the roll call starting on Docket 1376. Mr. Clerk. Roll call vote on docket number 1376. Council Arroyo. Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker. Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden. Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta. Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin. Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara. Council Lara, yes. Council Luzhen. Yes. Council Luzhen, yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Worrell. Yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 1376 has received a unanimous rule. This docket has passed. Council Flaherty, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, seeks acceptance of the committee report passage of the next docket which is docket 1476. Mr. Clerk, we're going to do a roll call vote. Roll call vote on docket number 1476, Council Arroyo. Nay. Council Arroyo, nay. Council Baker. Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden. Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta. Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin. Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara. No. Council Lara, no. Council Lujan. No. Council Lujan, no. Council Mejia. No. Council Mejia, no. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Worrell. No. Council Worrell, no. Docket number 1476 has received seven votes in the affirmative and five votes in the negative. This docket has passed. Mr. Clerk. Uh, Council Flaherty, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of the next docket, which is 1477. Can we please do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 1477. Council Arroyo. No. Council Arroyo, no. Council Baker. Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden. Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta. Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin. Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara. No. Council Lara, no. Council Louis Jean. No. Council Louis Jean, no. Council Mejia. No. Council Mejia, no. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Worrell. No. Council Worrell, no. Docket number 1477 has received seven votes in the affirmative and five in the negative. This docket has passed. Council Flaherty, the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of the next docket, which is 1478. Roll call vote on docket number 1478. Council Arroyo. Nay. Council Arroyo, nay. Council Baker. Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden. Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta. Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin. Yes. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara. 
Council Lara, no. Council Lujan, no. Council Lujan, no. Council Mejia, no. Council Mejia, no. Council Murphy, yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Worrell, no. Council Worrell, no. Docket number 1478 has received seven votes in the affirmative and five in the negative. This docket is passed. Council Flaherty, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 1479. Mr. Clerk, we're going to do a roll call vote. Docket, uh, roll call vote on docket number 1479. Council Arroyo. Nay. Council Arroyo, nay. Council Baker. Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Braden. Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta. Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council Durkin. Council Durkin, yes. Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara. No. Council Lara, no. Council Lu Jen. No. Council Lu Jen, no. Council Mejia. No. Council Mejia, no. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Worrell. No. Council Worrell, no. Docket number 1479 has received seven votes in the affirmative, five in the negative. Thank you. This docket has passed. We're on to matters recently heard for possible action. Before we do that, Council Lujan, did you want to speak? Yes. The, the chair recognizes Council Lujan at this time. Thank you. And I just wanted to make a small point because how late we got all of the information and my team is currently reviewing because I have not had the opportunity to review. Just wanted to put um, on the record that um, the, the, the claim, this is a, allegedly about gang, gang intelligence, street violence, but the record sent to the council said that this funding is for counterterrorism and that 30 of the 40 analysts at BRIC are focused on counterterrorism and domestic extremism. Um, and it's a lot to hear about these speeches about the importance of BRIC for anti-gun violence, but that's not what this funding about or there needs to be more clarity. That's why it's important for us to have had the grants because they're telling DHS one thing and we're receiving another thing. And that's why these questions that I asked were not just random questions. It's about the root of what this money is being used for. Just wanted to state that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Lujan. We're on to matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, we're on to docket 1300. Docket number 1300, ordinance amending City of Boston Code, ordinances chapter 12, section 12-20. Latino and Caribbean Affairs for Public Health and Welfare. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Royo, the Chair of Government Operations. Council Royo, you have the floor. Thank you. This is Docket 1300, uh, 1300 an Ordinance Amending City of Boston Code, Ordinances Chapter 12, Section 1220, Latino and Caribbean Affairs for Public Health and Welfare, was referred to the Committee on August 9th, 2023, and sponsored by Councilors Julia Mejia, Brian Worrell, and myself. We held a hearing on August 31st, 2023, and a working session on October 2nd, 2023. And I'd like to thank my council colleagues for attending. We had Councillor Flynn, uh, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Murphy, and Councillor Durkin present, uh, as well as the sponsors. Uh, Docket 1300 would amend the City of Boston Code of Ordinances by creating a dedicated office equipped to attend to the growing needs of the historically excluded populations in Boston. This office seeks to ensure that services and policies address the needs and concerns of historically excluded communities through community engagement efforts, services, and policies, as well as a way to monitor the progress and provide oversight and accountability on the impact of the city's policies, programs, procedures, and protocols. This ordinance would call for a director of cultural affairs to be appointed by the mayor. The director's main responsibilities would include advising and assisting in developing policies designed to assist historically excluded residents while enhancing the accessibility of city programs. Uh, services and benefits in addition to conducting research and soliciting community and stakeholder input. At the working session, the committee reviewed language changes regarding the responsibilities of the director, including management responsibilities. Specific language is added to refer to cultural advisors and their responsibilities. Uh, language is added to define historically excluded cultural communities in order to identify the groups that are covered by this ordinance. The ordinance in its amended draft gives the city flexibility to address cultural communities based upon need. And the title of the ordinance in the office is amended to the Office of Cultural Affairs to give the city more flexibility and address the current cultural liaisons uh, that currently exist and will be reorganized under this office. Uh, as chair of the Committee on Government Operations, I ask that the council accept the recommendation that this docket ought to pass in a new draft, and I defer to my colleague, uh, lead sponsor, Councilor Julia Mejia, if she has uh, any additional remarks, or Council Royal. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just wanted to, uh, in advance, thank my colleagues for their, uh, what I hope would be a favorable yes vote on something so important to the city of Boston, right? This is an opportunity to really show up for people. 
who have been left out of so many conversations. So I am just incredibly grateful to my colleague, Councillor Morrell, for your leadership in this space, um, uh, as well as um, Chair Arroyo for your insight in shepherding us through this process. You know, all politics aside, you know, I, I think that the city of Boston prides itself in being a leader in a lot of spaces, and I feel like we have an opportunity to really center um, folks who have felt left out of a lot of opportunities here in the city of Boston. And so um, if there's one thing that we can do to repair harm and create space for people to feel seen and heard and validated and affirmed, I think um, creating opportunities such as this is the way to go. So I am encouraging my colleagues to um, vote in favor um, and let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn, and thank you to uh, Council Julie Mejia for your leadership in this space, and Council Arroyo for helping us uh, get to this point through uh, shepherding the process. And uh, this is a great moment. Um, we have going to be voting on a um, cultural affairs um, uh, department and uplifting, you know, our diversity um, and the city putting that as a priority um, is, is just shows significance to, to um, the energy you know that that we have here in the city with the cultural groups and uh, just looking forward to you know what this department um, is going to signal to the rest of the city of Boston and the energy that it's going to um, bring out of some of those communities so looking forward to the policy recommendations that come out of this office um, and the energy um, and the work uh, so looking forward to a, 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 a good vote for my colleagues. Thank you, Council Royal. <clears throat> Council Royal seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 1300 in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket 1300 passed in a new draft. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1197? Docket number 1197, message in order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $3 million in the form of a grant for the Transforming Boston Grant awarded by the Andrew E. Mellon Foundation to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. The grant will fund uh, the support of community and curatorial partnerships, new temporary commemorative installations, and related public art programs. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta, the chair of the Committee on Arts, Culture, Special Events. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this, this matter was sponsored by the mayor and was referred to the Committee on Arts, Culture, and Special Events on July 19th, 2023. The Committee on Arts, Culture, and Special Events held a public hearing on October 2nd, 2023 in the Ionella Chamber to, to take testimony and consider the same. Councilors present included myself and Council President Ed Flynn. A letter of attendance was read into the record by Councilor Brian Worrell with great questions, and I do encourage everybody to review um, the tape in its entirety. Um, Kara Elliott Orte Ortega, uh, Chief of Arts and Culture, and Karen Goodfellow, Director of Public Art from the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, made a presentation on the particulars of this grant and responded to questions from the councilors. The presentation included the specific use of these funds and the various other related components, the backgrounds, history, uh, funding source, and expectations, the formation of a uh, representative and diverse advisory committee, the process of outreach. There's going to be significant um, community outreach done with a portion of this grant, uh, applications, selections, allocations, and management of all the phases of these projects. Boston was among just a few cities nationally to receive this level of funding from the Andrew E. Mellon Foundation. The other cities awarded include Chicago, Los Angeles, Portland. I'm not going to list uh, everything, but it is um, very prestigious that we were able to, to uh, receive this grant. There will be continuous efforts uh, in community outreach to ensure awareness, input, and active participation from cultural leaders and interested stakeholders in all of the processes of planning, implementation, and evaluations. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture is actively engaged in continuous efforts to facilitate and promote the access, participation, and inclusion of historically underserved neighborhoods and communities. Um, I also made an ask to, be, um, to receive demographic data on the artists who have been awarded commissions um, to promote shared prosperity uh, in, in the arts and culture space. 
So based on the testimony and information presented at the hearing and having considered the same, I respectfully recommend that this matter ought to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Council Carter. Council Carter seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of this docket 1197. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has passed. We're on to motions, orders, resolutions. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1548, please? Docket number 1548, Council Dirk can offer the following. Resolution recognizing Elliot Laffer. Thank you. The chair recognizes uh, Councilor Durkin. Councilor Durkin, you have the floor. I just wanted to say thanks uh, to all my colleagues for recognizing Elliot Laffer today. Um, 49 years of uh, civic participation really deserves, um, a, you know, applauding. So thank you all for indulging in this special presentation this, uh, in, earlier in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Durkin. Would anyone like to speak in this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand, Mr. Clerk. Please add. Uh, Councilor Baker, Councilor Braden, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Louis Jean, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Worrell, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Coletta, please add the chair. Councilor Durkin seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of this docket. 1548, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it. This docket has been adopted. We're on two late files. We have two late file matters. One is a one is an absence letter. Okay. One is an absence letter, and one is a request for a flying of a flag, a particular flag. Um, I want to make sure, Mr. Clerk, they're on everyone's desk at this time. Does everybody have these two documents? I didn't see the flag. Okay. We're going to take a brief minute to make sure that. We're going to take a brief minute, brief recess to make sure that these dockets get on everyone's desk. Brief recess. We're back in session. I just want to check to make sure everyone has a copy of these dockets. Mr. Clerk, can we take a vote on adding these two dockets to the agenda? We'll, all those in favor of adding these two dockets into the agenda, please say aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. These late file matters are added. Mr. Clerk, will you please read the first late file matter, which is the um, absence letter? Dear President Flynn and esteemed colleagues, uh, I hope this message finds you well. I regret to inform you that I'd be unable to attend today's city council meeting. I'll review the recorded footage and will follow up on any matters that require my attention or input. Thank you for your understanding. Sincerely, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Thank you. This late file matter will be added to, um, yeah, be placed on file. The next late file matter, Mr. Clerk. Second late file matter is a, a, uh, an order by the council president on behalf of all the councilors regarding the Hispanic Heritage Observation in the United States. It began in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Lyndon Johnson. It was expanded by President Ronald Reagan in 1988 to cover a 30-day period. It was enacted into law on August 17, 1988. And be resolved that the City Council Assemble do hereby proclaim Wednesday, October 11, 2023 to be Hispanidad Flag Day in the City of Boston. 
Thank you, Mr. Clark. We're on to green sheets. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. This late file matter. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. <clears throat> Would anyone like to add their name? They, they already did. Um, it's already signed. We're on to, thank you. We're on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to take something out of the green sheets may do so at this time. We're on to the consent agenda. I have been informed by the clerk that there are no additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. We're on to memorials. I, be I believe at least one colleague asked to speak about a loved one. And I ask if you do want to speak about a, a loved one or, or a family member or a constituent, um, you do have the opportunity to do, to do that. Um, let me recognize those names that were forwarded to me, and then I could open it up to my colleagues. For Councillor Braden, Caitlin Kalman. For Councillor Coletta, Maria D. Fioradino. For Councillor for Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn, Bill Good. For Councillor. Flynn and the entire city council body. Billy Callahan, the husband of Steve Fox. And Ian Milkalik, along, along with Council, council Flaherty as well. Councilor Lara Celestino Paradis for Councilor Louis Jean. Margaret Romain, John Yazanin, on the 23rd anniversary of his, of his death after collapsing during football practice at only age 14 years old. For Council Louis Jean Murphy and the entire city council, George Lee, a Boston Police Department civilian employee in their operations division. For Council Louis Jean and the entire City Council body, Solika Mandela, granddaughter of Nelson Mandela. For Council Murphy and the entire City Council, Nancy Mikowitz, who served the City of Boston for over 28 years in their licensing department. For the entire City Council, Tim Wakefield from the Boston Red Sox, Russ Francis from the New England Patriots, and California S Senator Dianne Feinstein. A moment of silence, please. At this time, I do want to give my colleagues an opportunity It's a test, it's a test. Okay. At this time, I do want to give my colleagues an opportunity to speak, to speak, we're still in session, everybody, to speak about a loved one at this time. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Oh, what poor timing with that. Um, national uh, emergency test, that was just a test for everybody watching. Um, so I, I would love to provide comments, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for allowing me to speak on, um, in memory of Maria uh, D. Bernardino de Libero, East Boston has lost, yes, lost yet another giant in the community who is uh, an incredible activist, a successful entrepreneur. She built an empire. 
And uh, after that, she was incredibly generous and kind um, with, with her wealth. Um, she is of East Boston um, and also of Pescara, Italy. She passed away peacefully on September 23rd. Um, she has a, a, a very large family in East Boston, and my heart and thoughts go out to them. Maria was a trailblazer who was fiercely independent and forever determined to be the best person she could be. She was a successful, self-taught businesswoman, an entrepreneur who always gave 110% to anything she did. She was a generous community leader and activist. She was uh, a proud Kiwanis member and member of the Sacred Heart Church. Maria pursued many passions throughout her life. She loved to play tennis, traveling the world, gardening, and spoiling her grandchildren. Her greatest passion was spending time in the kitchen, cooking and baking delicious food for everyone to savor. Um, as, as a survivor, uh, folks called her an energizer bunny, and she was determined to live each day to the fullest. She instilled in everyone the importance of generosity, kindness, and dependability. Um, she was an inspiration to, to me and my family, and um, I will always remember her. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Coletta. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to take a moment to um, remember um, Caitlin Coleman, uh, a young woman who was taken from us way too soon at the age of 42 um, to a rare form of uterine cancer. Caitlin is the daughter of Michael and Louise Coleman. Louise is the former principal at the Winship School and a, for, uh, very involved in our neighborhood. So I just want to extend our, our sympathies and uh, support to the Coleman and the Mahoney family in, in Alston Brighton. Thank you, Council Braden. The Chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I just wanted to lift up the name of Juana um, Celestino Paredes, who is um, Jackie Celestino, our communications director's mother. Jackie has been with us for um, a little bit over a year and, and has been the main caretaker for her parents and left our office uh, late this spring to go take care of, of her parents and her mother passed away. Um, a couple of months ago in Mexico. And so I just wanted to lift up her name to say thank you uh, to Jackie for all the work that she did for our office here on the city council while she was doubling up as the caretaker for her mother. Her mother joined us in a lot of events and districts. She came to all of our Walking City Trail events, joined us at the Wake Up the Air Festival, and so some of the counselors here might have met her. But even though she wasn't from District 6, she was, by way of her daughter, incredibly involved uh, and really made an impact on, on all of us. So I just wanted to send our condolences on behalf of the counselor to, to Jackie and her family. Thank you, Council Laura. The chair recognizes Council louis -Jean. Council louis -Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, um, and I, was, I think I was also out when you, um, for the Latino Heritage Month, so if you could add my name, I'd appreciate that. Um, but I, I wanted to just speak uh, in memory of John Yassayan, um family, from the Yassayan family from um, Rosendale and West Roxbury. Um, 23 years ago, as you read, Mr. President, um, John Yassayan was my locker mate at school, and uh, I remember saying goodbye to him um, as we were often hanging out um, and then getting a call an hour later that he had passed away um, during football practice at the Clemente Field right next to Latin. And it was, a, it was deeply emotional for obviously his family and for our classmates, but every day, every year on October 4th, I think about him and his family. Um, and I just want to give a sh uh, my best to his mother, uh, who in so many ways became part of our community. Um, Rita Yassayan, um, there were his brothers, Garo and Rafi Yassayan, and their father, and that, just a reminder that on every October 4th, me and my classmates were always thinking of um, John Yassayan, who's number 40 on the football team. So just want to lift up his memory and uh, remind that we're always thinking about him. Thank you. Thank you, Council louis -Jean. And yes, Council louis -Jean, you, you signed the document, so your name was added. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Um, thank you. I'd just like to take a moment to wish my son, the baby, and the family, Michael, a 24th birthday today. It would also be Colin's 27th birthday this week, and my oldest son, Brian, turns 34 later this week. So I just wanted to wish them all a happy birthday. Their mom loves them, so thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. <coughs> the chair moves that when we do so, we do so in memory of those mentioned. And we are now scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, October 18th at 12 noon. Before we do adjourn, I do want to say thank you to the clerk, the assistant clerk, the stenographer, my city council colleagues and their staff, and the city council staff as well. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. aye.
This council is adjourned. Thank you.